welcome back dear students this is another lesson for Cambridge O level sociology 2251 today we will look at how to answer a 15 marks question with an example in this lesson therefore we'll look at what should go into a 15 marks question however before that we look at the assessment objectives as per the syllabus and afterwards we look at the 50 marks question with an example let's look at the planning of the question before we go into the question itself in any question a set type question you should start with an introduction and in an introduction you should be able to show that you understand the question and a, to some extent the scope of the question the examiner should know that you have understood what is the question about and what would be your orientation in that question then in the next part you have to start by giving the arguments that support the question so there will be one argument plus an example to support that argument you give one idea at a time in one paragraph with the example at the same time you should be able very often to show whose argument it is for example we have spoken earlier about the positivist and the anti-positivist and therefore you should be able to say where this idea comes from later on you will see that there are different forms of ideas coming from what you call the Marxist the feminist the functionalist and therefore whenever you're answering a question you should point out whose idea it is whose argument it is and therefore you go to the second argument in the same way you put a second idea and you support it with example and we point out whose argument is this after you have uh, given all the arguments to support the question you will go to the next part of the answer here you start giving other arguments which might not necessarily support the ideas that you have been uh, explaining so far so therefore we come to assess in other words we have to show how far we agree with the arguments that they have presented so far so there will be counter argument one with one idea and some examples to support that argument here also you have to show who are those who bring forward this type of counter argument if you had earlier provided the positivist argument here you will give the anti-positivist arguments why do they disagree and you can go on with other counter arguments or if you have given some ideas you should come up with a different set of ideas which are different from what you have been giving earlier so here you start to a certain extent showing your ability to assess how far do I agree why do I agree what are the other arguments besides what I have already explained earlier you have so far presented the arguments for the question the arguments against the question now you should come to the conclusions and here you have concluding paragraphs you need not have only one paragraph but you have a few paragraphs which explain what should I understand from the arguments above this may contain more than one paragraph like I said and you make it a point to show why you give some set of examples and then counter set of examples to show to the examiner that you have been able to present the arguments for and the argument against another important thing that you should do in just a few words you should be able to link your conclusion to the question in other words 
the examiner should understand that you have in fact answered the question and you have completed the answer. So now we're going to see from proper example how to go about doing this. But before that we look at the assessment objectives of the O-level syllabus. To be able to answer your question well, you should know exactly what are the assessment objectives of your syllabus. In other words, what do the examiners expect you to understand and to demonstrate in the questions that you are answering. We have the assessment objectives 1 which details the knowledge and understanding that you should display. It says candidates should be able to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of appropriate sociological topics. So you should be able to show that you understand the topic that you are discussing. Understand the theoretical and practical consideration influencing the design and application of sociological inquiry. In other words, you should be able to show who are the sociologists who are for, what are the theories which support the argument, what are the theories which are against the argument. What are the practical considerations means in your question in research methodology for instance you have to show uh, what are the practical advantages or problems that you get when you use particular methods of investigation and you should be able to understand and apply sociological terminology and concepts in other words the terms that you use, the concepts that you use should be applied properly. That is why you should learn the language of the discipline. Sometimes when you don't learn it properly in English, you just learn it in some other language, in Creole or in French, and when you're writing in English, you don't get the concept right. So sometimes it's okay to learn to translate in another language to grasp the meanings quickly. But you should know how to use the concepts with precision in English. The second assessment objective, the AO2 in your syllabus, is interpretation of evidence. Here the examiners say that candidates should be able to demonstrate an awareness of the main methods of sociological inquiry and their uses. This is what we have been doing so far, looking at the different methods of sociological inquiry, looking at where we use them, giving you examples of it. You should be able to interpret and apply relevant evidences and data. Here you will be able to give proper arguments, proper evidence, use proper information and data to substantiate what you're saying. You will be able to do this in many of the chapters that you will study and this is what the examiner is looking for. At the same time, show an awareness of different types and sources of evidence. In other words, you should be able to show the evidence provided by the positivist, the anti-positivist, the Marxist, the feminist, so you should be able to show where these arguments come from, whose arguments they are. This is interpretation of evidence. The last and probably the most important assessment objective is analysis and evaluation. Here the examiners say that candidates should be able to evaluate the strength and limitation of particular social studies and methods. In the chapter we covered so far, we have looked at the strength and limitation of the sociological methods. In other chapters where you do, for instance, family, education or mass media, there you will have information on the strength and limitation of different sociological studies. You should be able to recognize the limitations and bias in evidence and distinguish between fact, opinion and values. 
In other words, you should be able to show what are the arguments given, how far these arguments are based on facts, how far they are just opinions or biased opinions based on the values of particular people. So these are ways of arguing, uh, ways of criticizing, showing limitations of arguments. You should be able to reach conclusions based on reasoned consideration of available evidence. In other words, everything you say must be substantiated with evidence. You can't just say something, I like it, this is my way of looking at things. No. You should be able to show who says it. Are they functionalist? Are they Marxist? Are they feminist? Are they positivist or anti-positivist? These are what you mean by evidence. And in the end, you should be able to organize and present social evidence and arguments in a coherent and purposeful form. This is why when you write, I showed you in the beginning the schema, you should organize your arguments properly. It should flow from one paragraph, one part to another. And this is what examiners look for and probably they give the highest marks for these type of answers. After understanding the three types of assessment objectives examiners expect, let's look at uh, how these assessment objectives are marked. For instance, for knowledge and understanding, you get between 35 and 40 marks. For interpretation of evidence, you get around 30 to 35 percent marks and for analysis and evaluation about 25 to 30 percent marks. So you understand that if you know your book by heart, you go and reproduce everything, you write everything, you have demonstrated knowledge and understanding. But remember, for that you get only 35 to 40 percent marks for learning by heart and reproducing, writing everything. So you should be careful. Not that you have written everything and because of that you should get highest marks. You should be able to show evidence of interpretation of evidence and analysis and evaluation. It is here that you get the most amount of marks. And that is why sometimes you have answered well, but you don't get through the examination. You feel you have answered well, but you haven't answered well. You have just reproduced the book without showing evidence of interpretation, of analysis, or evaluation. You should learn all this and you'll be able to do it only if you practice answering questions regularly and develop these skills of interpretation, analysis, evaluation, which you call the higher order skills. We have covered the first unit theory and methods and you should look at your syllabus carefully and see what the examiners expect you to learn there. It says the first unit provides a foundation for the other parts of the syllabus by considering the approaches and procedures used in sociological research. So this is what we are doing. This chapter is very important because a lot of the skills you develop here will help you understand and interpret what you're going to do in other chapters. At the same time, it says this provides a basis for understanding the uniquely sociological way of looking at society. In other words, it helps you understand how different sociologists from different perspectives look at society, especially the positivist and the anti-positivist. This chapter also underpins and provides an understanding of each of the other study units. In other words, they're the basic skills and knowledge and analysis and interpretation skills that you learn here will help you across the syllabus as a whole. Because in the whole of the syllabus, you'll refer to the methods through which those knowledge were gathered, how they are interpreted by different sociologists from different perspectives. 
Now that you have understood what is expected of you, let's look at the question which says assess the view that only the positivists are interested with sampling. Assess the view, in other words, you have to show a lot of analysis and evaluation skills, which we said brings about 25 to 30% of the marks. In this type of question, you should start by showing that you have a knowledge of the question that you have enough evidence of the question and you're able to make an analysis of those evidences. First, you should look carefully at what the question is implying. The question says, assess the view that only the positivists are interested with sampling. In other words, they imply that only the positivists use sampling as they cannot study the whole population. But this also implies that other sociologists, such as anti-positivists, do not use sampling. Is this true? Not necessarily. Because you should remember that sampling is just a part of the population. In fact, anyone studying anything has to decide whom to study or what aspect of the problem to study and therefore these are sampling decisions. So you should use these three ideas to write a simple small introduction in around three lines. Remember in an introduction you should give an indication to the examiner that to understand the question, that what is the implication of the question and what will be your line of argument. Therefore, in the main body of the answer, after the introduction, you should start by giving quickly a small explanation of sampling, that sampling is part of the population. And you should argue that any sociologist has to make a decision on whom to study and therefore a decision on sampling. Next, you go to the positivist straight and explain that the positivists cannot study the whole population. They are interested in generalization and therefore they need a representative sample. They use various types of sampling, such as random sampling, and the most favored one is stratified random sampling that allows a better representative sample. Sometimes they might also use systematic sampling, which is acceptable for large population, though it is not perfectly random. So you explained, positivist, how positivists use samples. Next, you have to ask yourself the question, do po only positivists use sampling? It is evident that sampling is a major concern of positivists. Nevertheless, to argue that they are the only one interested in sampling is not proper. And therefore you should show that any sociologist using any part of the population is in fact making a decision on whom to study and has to justify the sample. And therefore, irrespective of whether a positivist or an anti-positivist, they both use certain sampling techniques and make certain sampling decisions. However, the interpretive sociologists use smaller samples as they are not interested in generalization. They are concerned with in-depth study that would reveal the reasons behind human action. So therefore, they do not have to use the same type of samples as the positivist, but they do make sampling decisions. In other words, you have started assessing the question. You have started arguing that the question is one-sided 
it is not true to say that only positivists use sampling interpretive sociologists also use sampling so what are the decisions made by interpretive sociologists for example the decisions such as whom to study depending on the nature and objective of the study they should also decide on when to study what to study they have to sample the events the frequency for instance the sociologist might decide to observe a particular class it could be a purposive sample it fits the purpose of the researcher or a convenient sample which is convenient for the given circumstances what do we mean exactly by what to observe for instance how the teacher introduces a lesson or how students respond to the teacher at the beginning of a class or when they are asked to answer a question or work in a group all these are decisions that the sociologist should make while deciding on what to observe the researcher obviously cannot observe everything that goes on in the classroom but makes a decision on what to observe in a number of lessons these are sampling decisions in interpretive studies understand that by giving these examples you have shown to the examiner that you understand certain sampling decisions taken by interpretive sociologists and previously you explained the sampling decision taken by the positivist and you're saying that it is not only the positivist but also the interpretivist who make sampling decisions and have explained how the next step is to reach a conclusion the concluding paragraphs in fact here you need not write only one concluding paragraph but you can write a few paragraph which wraps up all the arguments you have made so far for instance you say it is evident that every researcher should make a decision on what to study what to observe whom to observe the first sampling is the concern of all sociologists the positivists seek to obtain a representative sample for the purpose of generalization whereas the anti-positivists do it to enable them to decide on what to study for an in-depth understanding of the problem they are investigating another important thing that you should do in your conclusion before the, you end your answer is to go back to the question in other words you go back and show to the examiner that you have answered the question you can say that sampling is not used by positivists alone any sociologist studying any part of the population is making a sampling decision this include interpretivist and uh, this would be the final paragraph on the whole make sure that you change paragraph for each new idea you introduce this will allow the examiner to understand your arguments and of course do not forget to write a conclusion which is linked to the question asked remember what I showed you at the start your introduction to show you understand the question your arguments that support the question the counter arguments and the conclusions which wrap up the answer as a whole and linking of your conclusion to the questions asked we have reached the end of this lesson i hope you understood clearly how to answer a question and what are in fact the expectations of the examiners and how you should prepare yourself to answer a 15 marks question thank you very much for your attention and i'll see you very soon bye Oh, 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 oh,